and welcome to our Midweek Connect Point. And if we can all stand and let's just ask God to touch us tonight. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for this opportunity to gather here together in your name, God. Jesus has your people, Lord. Jesus has your children, God, who have been um, bought by your blood and purchased, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for this opportunity, Lord Jesus. We never want to take it for granted, God. We know there are people, Lord Jesus, that um, it is illegal, God, for them to get together and to meet in the freedom of the gospel, the freedom to study your name, to share your word, to worship you out loud, God. So we don't want to take this for granted, even those who are able to watch online, God, there are places in this world, Jesus, where they would have to be in a closet and hidden, God. So tonight, God, as we gather together, we don't want to take it for granted, but we want to be thankful for the freedom that you've given us, God, and we want to take opportunity of it, Lord Jesus, as we go through your word tonight, God, I pray that it would be made alive in each and every one of us, God, and we'd be solidified and strengthened, God, and drawn closer to you, God. We give you all praise. We give you all glory. We thank you for this opportunity. I pray you would anoint my mind and my mouth, God, as I try to deliver, Lord Lord Jesus, this word that um, you led me to study, Lord Jesus, and I pray that we would just have a great time in you and an uplifting time in you. We would go back, God, into our homes, into our neighborhoods, into this world, God, and be a light for you. We thank you for everything you're doing. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And um, I'll, I'll say it at the end as well, but just wanted to remind everybody that uh, today started our prayer and fasting, and um, you know we're going to go until Sunday. Pastor left a message on the call, and uh, so just join on that. If you can go every day straight, do that. If you need to break it up, however, whatever you need to do, be a part of it. And then Saturday night at 9 o'clock, we're going to have our all-night prayer meeting. And uh, it's all night if you can. Um, just come as close to 9 as possible and stay as long as you can and allow. And uh, if you need to bring a blanket and a pillow or something like that, that's okay, too. And um, we're just going to have an incredible time and see what God does. Amen? Amen. Um, and I'll, I'll say it again at the end just to remind us. We are going tonight, our first scripture uh, we're going to start in is Romans chapter 12, and it's a very common scripture. And 12 verse 1, and I'll read it. I have a couple different versions. We'll start with the King James. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I'll read that again. Um, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies at a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So this is a scripture that we are all very familiar with. If you're um, if you've been in the Christian faith a uh, long time, hopefully this is not only a scripture you're familiar with, but a, a scripture I know for me that uh, time to time I'm led back to pray that over my life and to be reminded of the place that I need to be. And Pastor has been preaching on Sundays as when Pastor asked me to speak, I was trying to seek God and what to what we could do on our midweek connect. And um, that theme, which, you know, is in present, reset, reset was kind of there. So I said, okay, God, um, what about it, you know? And uh, and I, I guess I felt, if anything, just to, and I don't know if this is the only time or it may be the first of one or two or three, who knows, but we'll just kind of start the journey together. And, um, and I felt that, uh, the Bible, as we know, it has many life lessons. If uh, what's amazing to me is you can think of any person at your job, you know, in your neighborhood, a family member, and there's somebody in the Bible um, who did that, whatever that thing is that they happen to do that gets on your nerves, right? <laughs> and um, nothing, as I say, nothing is new under the sun, like, in, uh, but people are in the Bible and there are examples of. Um, the greatness of man, and there's a lot of examples even more of the frailty of man. So in that, uh, there are stories 
and if you will, or moments, and whether they be for an individual, whether it be for a nation, of what we might call reset in, um, in that process. So I just kind of want to walk through that today. And I was, the first thing I was like, okay, where do I start? And um, uh, at least in the King James, and, may, and I think the ESV, the word reset is actually not in the Bible. So um, I, I didn't find that in there. I thought about searching, maybe if I could try to search a concordance or something like that. But um, so I'm like, okay, um, you know, that's our first thing we do, right, is search something. And I'm like, okay, where to start? In the scripture, which, I've, again, we're all familiar with it, but this Romans chapter 12, and I was thinking about this um, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And this this transformation of the mind, that's a reset, if you will. That is a reset. So I'm like, okay. So we'll go back to there, to um, Romans 12. And uh, I have it in the ESV. It says, and it's very similar, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. It changes over there and says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Net Bible, it says um, in, in verse, two, verse 2, says, do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. So we have this, again, this, this, these two verses we're well acquainted with, and it starts out in verse uh, 1. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. So a living sacrifice. As we know, sacrifices are dead. <laughs> so this statement is, it's like, okay, your sacrifice needs to be whole and acceptable. Like, okay, we understand that. But he says a living sacrifice. And, and here, when he says, it says holy, which um, this word holy, it means to be sacred, consecrated. And, and when it says acceptable, that means well-pleasing, pleasing. So you hear is you have these adjectives, and it says it's living. So it's alive, it's holy, and it's pleasing. And it's, it's almost it's showing a contrast now to what the standard was for thousands of years. And that was that are supposed to bring something and that it was going to be killed as a sacrifice. But now it's saying that we are now presenting ourselves. So no more the best animal or the first or the crop of a harvest or anything like that. Um, it's now the best of us, the first fruits of us. He's saying present that as a sacrifice now ourselves so that's a that's a very um we read it as not like it's it's something we're very familiar with but what he was saying is actually very like countercultural, because for years they've only known one way of doing something and now he's presenting that we are the sacrifice and as i was reading uh, one of the study i guess one of the commentaries um they said it, they said it, which I thought was funny. They said the problem with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> and that's so true. And um, once something's dead, it's gone, and you wait for the next time. But as we are living sacrifices, it is our, we strive to stay on the altar. But this world, our life, our flesh, wants to get off the altar. Sometimes it wants to jump. Uh, sometimes it wants to crawl or sneak off. Sometimes we just want to have a foot or two or a hand off the altar so we can feel a little bit of freedom and feel like we have everything else. But um, as they say, you're either dead or alive. You know, they say you beat me half to death, but you're still alive. Yes, you're, you're, you can't be, you know what I mean? So um, you're either 
on the altar completely or you're you're not really on the altar. You're trying to get off. Amen. So we have this this first concept of a living sacrifice. That's what we're supposed to be. And then it goes off and it says next, it says this is, which is your, so holy, acceptable, which said pleasing unto God, which is your reasonable service. And reasonable, this just, this means rational, logical. It's saying like, this, this just makes sense to do. Like this is, why does it make sense? Because y'all have done it for years. Y'all understand this concept, but now, so now that God has, Jesus has died and risen. It's not that there's no more, the sacrifice is now not something and for animal. It's now ourselves. So we can all understand that concept, but now it's us. So that's, the, and, and that was in the Old Testament, that animal that we gave, that was a reasonable service. And another word for that service meaning is actually worship. So that's why you have some translations say that. So we go to verse 2. And it says, and be not conformed to this world. And this word here is, um, as it said, conformed to this world, it's, it's, meaning, it's meaning is to fashion after or to fashion according to. And so it's basically saying, like, be not trying to look like, be like this world. So I was, as I was kind of, because I wanted to look into this world conformed. Interestingly, interestingly, how we say that enough, this word was only used two times in the whole New Testament. So there wasn't much context to grab from in that case to see what other cases it was used. And, um, and it was used in the same kind of context. So I uh, looked a little more studying and uh, I'll try to say this because I'm probably going to mess it up because English is not my um, best subject. I'm more of a math person in school. But um, they said this word, I, the way I put it, is this word here in the Greek, it, it, they said it could be partly be passive, but probably mostly passive. And um, there was like some kind of, I guess, permissive passive is the kind of word, whatever that means. And I'll read what they says here. It says, it's very telling that being conformed to the present world is viewed as a passive notion, for it may suggest that it happens in part subconsciously. At the same time, that passive could well be a permissive passive, suggesting that there may be some consciousness of the conformity taking place. Most likely is a combination of both. So what this is saying is that it's something that just by virtue of living, being in a world, that it is natural for us to start to be conformed. And uh, that word, I'm not even going to try to say the, what the word is in the Greek, and, um, but it's, it was interesting. It was made of two words. And one of them is that change, transfigure, transform. You know, in the other part of it, it's um, if you look, I think there's 130 instances of this word. And interestingly enough, most of them were saying with or together, even, and they went with him, and they went together. So that word is tied to, so saying with, and then the fashioned after, transform. But that word with stands for a couple things, or together it can mean by association, or it leads to, it lends to association, companionship, resemblance, possession. So if you look at it, it's saying this, uh, Conform when we're conformed, it's something where we're constantly being, we start to be associating with and we start resembling and we find companionship in this world. So again, it's, it's saying right here, what he's saying is that be not conformed to this world, but it's a natural thing. All you have to do is do nothing. And the people around you will start to rub off on you and um, if someone in 1995, and um, I was 12 in 1995, and um, I remember, it's, it's, it's not a good show, but I remember we would like, um, uh, I would try to sneak and watch, I think, The Simpsons, I think it's what it was like, and I, I knew that was a bad show, and, um, and uh, like, 
and there was, I guess what I'm saying is what, uh, I never forget, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to mention certain movies during sermons, but there was a movie, Kindergarten Cop. And I remember, I think when it came out, it was like rated R. Like it had a really high rating and then years later they like lowered it for whatever reason they're showing it on TV like it's just a regular kid's family movie. And um, even though it's like a hostage situation, kid kidnapping, I mean like that's a pretty intense um, movie like, but what I'm trying to say is you look at the 90s and even from obviously I was born in the 80s so I can't speak, but from what I've seen in history and learned in school, there was such a, there was a very slow progression of immorality and even with um, Woodstock in um, the hippie movement, they were seen as the outcasts. And it was, a, it was a rebellious thing to be like that because it was almost like, oh, we're gonna be rebellious so we're gonna go as far on the end as possible. Would you know that so many of those same things that were detestable, that were never thought about, that media would never even talk about, like they're literally daily, they're in cartoons now, they're, on the f they're in the family movies, these, these subjects, these things, like morality, this, this world has, like that's where conforming comes. It's, it's when the things, the evil, the, the, and whatever it is, these things just slightly touch and slightly influence and slowly push their agendas. And I lived in California, so I could, like, the stuff that is kind of out now, like, California was dealing with that stuff like 12 years ago. And some of the laws that are now just being passed, California was fighting and praying against that, the churches in California years ago. But what I'm saying is, even with the church in, um, we were moving the chairs, uh, we have new chairs, and we were passing the help loading all 200, sorry, all 197 of the old ones on Monday, plus another 29. And um, I was like my first workout of the year, and maybe my last one, and I'm still sore from that. But uh, I, I went to hand a chair, I think, to David, and I was touched by um, some holy anointed um, gum, about five or six different pieces that had lasted the ages. I'm sure somebody was at the altar praying and they just wanted to bless somebody else and stuck it under the seat, which I don't know why, like who puts gum? I still don't understand the whole concept, of gum, but it was, I turned it over and there was literally like five or six. So it must've been that one person sat there every Sunday. Anyway, um, I was like, man, I even, that story just got me off. So I'm, I'm not even sure where I was going with that. Um, Sorry, I just got lost. That I just got traumatized by that. Um, I don't know. It'll come back. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is things change. Things conform. Oh, that's what I was saying. Like I remember, I never, I never forget. We went to a church. They were a slightly different faith. Really nice church. Big church. You know, they had all the popular music people came in, and I walked in with, um, like, there were these ushers. Like if they saw you chewing gum, like as you're stepping in the, like even the foyer, they're gonna be like, hey, spit that gum out. And um, I remember one guy, we came, it was a Friday night concert and I was in the lobby and I had my hat on. And um, he like came on me like a bouncer or something like that, like you need to take your hat off, son. And I was like, sorry. <laughs> and um, he, was, he was a lot bigger than me too. And again, I'm, I'm not saying uh, whether if you put gum on the chair, you will make it to heaven or not. I don't know if you will, but that's just my opinion, but I don't have scripture for that. But what I'm saying is just in, in that cultural sense, there are things where like now um, you go places and I'm not judging anybody, but like, you know, um, everybody's like eating on a platform, like, you know, and, um, and, it's, and even the people, the elders who 20 years ago would have like, like basically kicked you out of church, they're not saying anything about it. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that they don't have a walk with God. I'm just saying um, as the world goes on, it is natural for us to conform. It is natural for us to lose things that are sacred, things that are holy to us for them to change. Sometimes it's not a bad thing. There's some things that need to be left in the past, but others, there are times there are other things that where they're attached to a God compass that opposed to a moral compass, because a moral compass will always um, disintegrate. It would always, it, it's, it will always keep going down, 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 down. That's that's what it is, because that's humanity. We start, we like we're born and we grow for a period of time, and then we're. 
going to our death. That makes sense. And so anything we do will end in death because only God has true life. So so is our society and so is this world. And again, this idea of conforming is, I, I guess I just want us to know that it is a natural thing. It can be, you can be doing good or feel like you're doing good and you start noticing, man, like I'm a little off course. If that makes sense, like I'm a little behind schedule. It's like um, if you ever been with someone who is not a multitasker and you're they're either driving or maybe they're shopping, you're and you're like, you know, you're, you go somewhere in this grocery store and you're like, okay, we got seven things to get. Hopefully we can be out here in 10 minutes. They hop on the phone and they're just walking around the aisles aimlessly. <laughs> And you're like, what in the, like, and they're passing by the stuff that's on the list. And the truth is, they're just distracted. They're, they're not focused. They're just living. They're just coasting. And that happens to us. That happens to us naturally. And then there's others of us or other times when we start getting associated and we start wanting to um, become and we start wanting to uh want companionship out of the things of this world and and we start conforming to such a deeper level until and, and and sometimes it's because the fear of fitting in or sometimes it's maybe because um we've tried other times and we feel like we're stuck with a life of failure so we just don't try to conform but we allow it because the truth is maybe something inside of us is broken and we don't have the courage to um, reach forward amen and and I've been all over all of those so here he's saying living sacrifice and then he talks about be um, be not conform one verse two yes so he says be not conformed to this world. And he says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. Uh, verse Matthew 17 and 2, it says, and was transfigured before them, it's talking about Jesus, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Um, Mark 9, 2, and it's a different version. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Sorry, reading a different version. After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and leadeth them up into the high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Um, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being Sorry, I'm reading the wrong version again. I have my version. But we all, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, that's a mirror, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So these three scriptures I read, they're talking about that word being transfigured. That's this moment where the fa his God's face is shining. It's this, it's this miraculous, without a doubt, moment. It's 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 something where you're being changed. It's you can, it's obvious and it's obvious. And 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 then in Second Corinthians, what they're saying here is that as a mirror, we're supposed to be we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. So the reason I I talked about I wanted to clarify because this word um, transformed is also the same word for transfigured. And sometimes when we think of transform, we're like, okay, you know, we're changing. But um, when we think about transfigured, we're like, wow, that's, you know, that's one of those words. Like, if you say, like, I saw Christ transformed, we're like, yeah. If we're like, I saw a face of Christ, he was transfigured. We're like, yes, yes. You know what I mean? But I want you to know they're the same word, the same word. So when it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that is a complete change. That is not just a mild thing. It is something new. It is something shining bright. Does that make sense? I, I, I just want to highlight that. Um, and again, we're talking about a reset that um, it is something where you are not the same person and the people around you 
feel something different. Now, depending on what kind of friends you are, they may encourage you or they may try to knock you down because they're used to being the important one in the friend group. But that's for another sermon. I'll just let, um, if it hits you, pray about that tonight. Write it on your notes and ask God to reveal who they are. Amen. But, um, so that was for free. But do uh, you understand what I'm saying? So it's, what he's saying is in the opposite of that. You don't have to, like, let your mind, let it, or by the renewing of your mind, you will be transformed into something completely new, something full of light. Amen? And it, in verse 2, it reads further. It says that you may, verse 2, prove, which, prove what is good and acceptable. And this prove here is, there's a couple of different words for it if you look through um, the Bible, and that the word in the Greek has a couple of different wordings. Uh, one of them is to examine, to test, to find, to try. So it's saying that ye may prove, and um, the, the word actually, the history of the word is actually, it's commonly applied to metals, like metal. And the operation of testing or trying them by the severity of fire, Henceforth, it also means to explore, investigate, ascertain. I'm reading this. This is from uh, the, the commentary. And it says, this is its meaning here. The sense is that such a renewed mind is essential to successful inquiry after the will of God. So it's saying once you have this renewed mind, and uh, what happens is we know things of the flesh are flesh, things of the spirit are spirit. So um, that's why arguing with some people is a waste of time because <laughs> flesh is flesh spirit is spirit and sometimes you can start in spirit and you're trying to prove something to the flesh and then you end up starting to operate you end up conforming <laughs> and then you leave mad and you're like man how do i even get there <laughs> amen um been there too so what what are so these two different things so what happens is we're trying to live this life, and we are, our mind, if it's not renewed, we're, we're off, we're amiss, we're, we're not really uh, sometimes able to hear or able to handle what God's will is, because again, we're trying to process it through a conformed mind. And so when you take all that together, we have a formula, anybody, like me, like math. No one likes math. We got somebody's volunteer. Wow, two people. It's okay to like math. It's okay. I know everybody like hates math. I like math. I was bad at every other subject, so I like math. And um, I was like, I'm good with numbers, bad with words. And every other subject has words. So um, school was a little struggle at times. Amen. So um, we have a formula here. And a living sacrifice, that's, that's the, um, or I'll put it like this, not conforming, but transforming, which allows you to discern God's will, that equals a living sacrifice. Meaning, in order to become, a, the process of being a living sacrifice means is that you're daily, you're actively trying not to conform but be transformed, renew your mind so that way you can not only hear God's will, but you can follow it and understand it. And that also means if we find ourselves not transformed, if our mind is kind of stuck in some areas, which again, I, this is a natural thing. This is a natural thing. If you find yourself, what I mean is, um, when I say natural, with, in our walk with God, there's hills and valleys. There's sometimes everything's going great, and then God desires more from us, so he brings us into a, a new place, and we're trying to hold on to that old place. And, um, and we're like, God, what's going on? He's like, you stopped renewing your mind because we, 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 we started doing kind of good. We, we're, we're doing good on the devotion. We got the Bible app. That thing goes off and be like, you've read your Bible uh, 14 days in a row, you're like, yes, you know, and, um, you know, so all these things, and you, you feel like you're there, if that makes sense, and then you start relaxing, and you start conforming, and conforming for you may not be conforming for somebody else, 
So conforming for you may have been like, God said, I want you to pray an hour and a half a day in slash devotion. And you're doing like 30, which is better than what you used to do. But you're kind of comparing yourself or conforming yourself to what you know what the other person is not doing because their attitude at church on Sunday. Amen. That's another sermon. Okay. So I guess what, what I want to say, what I want to, I guess, highlight is that this process of conforming and is what fights us. It's against this process of being a living sacrifice. And that's why, because every day we live in this world, every day we have to go to an altar of prayer and ask God to cleanse us and ask God to renew our minds. Does that make sense? And, and the, the benefit of that or what's promised is that we will know his will, what's good, what's perfect, what's acceptable. Amen? So I, um, I, if you think of Jacob in the Bible and uh, we know the story of Jacob and Esau, and his name meant the supplanter and um, the heel grabber, I believe. And like, so we know Jacob, and it's just kind of like, man, why did you have to name him that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, he, he's, he, of course, that's how he came out. He was already, he's already trying to get ahead. So, and we can look at his life in four stages. In his first stage, he, you know, grew up, and he was, him and his mom was, you know, they were close, and, uh, the dad favored Esau, which was the first issue in the house, amen, but that's another sermon too. And um, he, we, we see him in his natural ability in his mom, which sometimes your family will help you conform <laughs> to this world. <laughs> and they come up with this idea, which he was all good. She's, he had that natural ability, and she helped it, so we know what side of the family he got that from, obviously. And, um, and we see in his first stage, he basically tricks his brother into getting the birthright. And then, because he's cunning, he knows how to, he's cunning, so he knows how to take care, take advantage of people. Then he hits him, and he's like, I'm cunning, but I'm not a fighter, and my brother is. I'm getting out of here. So he leaves, and um, then he finds himself, and he still had a call on his life, and he still had a promise on his life, so he still experienced God's blessings. And his intellect, which, or his cunning, you know, whatever you want to call it, and um, there's people in Wall Street who are incredible administrative and um, business savvy people, and there's people on the streets um, who are incredible business savvy people, one's legal, the other one's not. But um, God gave both of them their mind and their, if that makes sense, God gave both of them their ability to use. So here we have Jacob, he's cunning, and now he's, he he's wants to get married and he meets his future father-in-law who does not mind giving him a run for his money, Laban. So this is the second, second place of his life and now he gets tricked. The trickster gets tricked. He met his match. And instead of instead of uh, just getting out of there, he's like, no, I really want I really want her. So he uh, he spends the extra six years. And and this next part of the Bible is really about the two of them trying to get over on each other constantly. And like I can't imagine like when they get together for dinner and they're just like faking it as if everything is good. And like they're they're talking in code about what they're trying to steal from the other person because it's just it's just really funny. You know, we've seen two competitive people and they get like in a um, or two really insecure people who get together and then they, uh, you know, they they're having these soft competition conversations or the one up person about like, well, I actually I went to vacation and blah, blah, blah. Well, we went to this. We went to Aruba and we went. Oh, really? Well, we went to Grand Cayman and we went scuba diving. Oh, well, we went on a submarine. Like you know, the the, the one uppers. It makes sense. So again, you have you have him, and now he's in this lifestyle of he's probably daily thinking about how he can deceive his father-in-law and and remain on top. And why he does this, he still has the blessings of God because there's a promise on his life. But that is not enough. And that was not enough. And some of us, sometimes we feel like we're doing okay because God's hand is on our life, because we're not in calamity. But the truth is there's an emptiness 
because we we are maybe partially we're trying to stay on the altar, but there's a lot of things in our life and about our daily life that are conformed. But yet we still have the blessings of God, which can make us feel okay. But he came to that point where he's conformed. And that night when he was wrestling, all of the energy and all of the cunningness and all of the fervor and passion that he had ever put into any business deal that he was sure he was going to win, he put that into this moment, this night, and says, I won't let you go. And in one night... He was transformed. He got a new name. And if I will say, in one night, he had a reset. He had enjoyed the blessings of God, but that wasn't enough. He had a reset. And his life after that was not perfect. He, he, he didn't, I, I'd love to say, and that was the end of the story, he lived perfect. No, he, he wasn't perfect, but his, his life was given towards God. And it's at the end of his life, it kind of leaves him and, you know, goes to the story of his sons and, um, it, it shows when Joseph now, we're years, years later, Joseph is in Egypt, and now he's calling back for his family, and his brothers come, and they prove it. And this is so, um, this is so beautiful, this, this story. And again, this is, this is the thinker of thinkers, the fast guy. The, you know, this is, this is who Jacob is. And um, of course, he's older, but in Genesis 45 and 28, it says, and Israel said, it is enough. When he's hearing it, he's like, Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. So he's saying, like, I'm so happy. He, was, he had been hurt. He had been depressed because of his son, his favorite son, and, um, which obviously there's a favoritism issue in the family. And, um, uh, but he finally hears that he is um, he's alive and he's just happy. And, and his thought is just, is just simply like, um, he just wants to see him before he dies. Because, I mean, after all, he lives in Egypt. So that's not the desire to go live there. But that's a thought. And then it goes to the next chapter. And, there, and it says, so Israel took his journey with all that he had, and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. Verse 2, it says, then, and God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, which I think is so cool. Like, he had a new name change, so respecting his name, but God was like, Jacob, Jacob, like, I see you as both. From the beginning, who you were and who you thought you were, I still, that's who I made you to be. And I gave you this new name, but the whole time it was still the same person who I had a plan for their life. Amen? And so God spoke to him, and he said, here I am. And so he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will, for I will there make of thee a great nation. For I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again, and Joseph shall put his hands upon thine eyes. And that just means um, when you pass away, Joseph will be there. You'll be with your son. And it's interesting because this is at the end of his life, you show someone who is welcoming and didn't even plan on moving until he heard the voice of God leading and directing him. And as we mentioned earlier in, in Romans like, when you have this, when your mind is transformed, you'll be able to discern, you'll be able to hear what this, the perfect will of God is. That makes sense? And he, he was able in this place, it wasn't something that, it doesn't show here that he had to think about it. Or he had to try to, he didn't start going to deal mode about what piece of property, if that makes sense. He, he just I'll trust in God and allowed God's will, which God made it clear to him. And um, he spoke to him. He's like, let me just make this clear so he doesn't maybe go back into the Jacob thing, the thinking. But that makes sense. At the end of his life, it shows that he was still okay. Instead of what can I do, what does God want me to do? Amen. And, and I say all that because for Jacob, it was an all-night prayer meeting, if you would. And, and, I'm, and I'm, just, I'm just talking serious. Like, um, I have to ask myself, Kevin, when was the last time you said enough is enough? I can't break this conformity. I can't throw all of myself on the altar. I may think I do on Sunday when I cry a little bit, but on Monday, I, my foot starts sliding off. And, and again, this is where Jacob was at. He said, okay, if it takes this all night prayer meeting, like I need a reset. I need to be transformed. 
Now, it just so happens we're having an all-night prayer meeting this Saturday <laughs> and um, that all of us have the opportunity to be a part of. But for some of us, it may be tonight or tomorrow or Friday. But I'm just, I guess what I just want to point out is that there, are when we need sometimes a reset, that it takes something different to break out of our conformity. Amen? I, we think about Moses, and um, in my mind, I was going to say, I'm not going to finish all my notes. And I was like, wait, pastor? <laughs> and, um, but uh, I'm not going to finish all my notes tonight. But um, uh, you think about Moses, and he, was, he grew up in Pharaoh's house, and he also was able to be, spend time with his family. So, you know, he kind of had the church and the world going on at the same time. And um, when he got older, you know, he wanted to... Uh, feel, what's the word? He wanted, you know, like, feel connected to his people and protect them, and um, which, as I'm thinking that, I'm just thinking about just this last, like, three or four years in America, but anyway, um, he's like, all of a sudden, he wants to do something, so he murders somebody. Um, righteous indignation, maybe, you know, but um, the way he did it, conformity, because he had lived in a house that basically anything they wanted to do, they did it. So that, that's how he was raised in, in power, except he did it to the wrong side. <laughs> if he would have did it to somebody, uh, one of the children of Israel, no one would have cared, but he, he, he did it to his, hit the wrong side. So he had some passion, but um, his, because he was in, um, because of his conformity, he went away, he went about it the wrong way. So what does he do? Like anybody who just committed a crime, he runs away <laughs> quickly, gets far away, like, yes, days away so no one will know and anything like that. So he goes and he's away for a while, gets married, has a new family. And um, now it's time for God to call him home. And because he has, he still had a call on his life. He had a purpose on his life. He calls him home and He's on his way, and he sees this burning bush, and it's what's going on. It's holy ground, you know, and um, he says he has a stutter problem, um, which is interesting because if you follow it, he talks anytime he feels really confident, and then when Pharaoh would say no, he would, like, stutter, and then somebody else would have to talk for him. So it's kind of interesting. So it's really a confidence issue, more or less a stuttering issue. But um, so, I mean, he throws down the rod. It turned to a snake. So it's like... He, he has God's talking to him. He's, he's experiencing the miraculous, and then God uses him in the miraculous. Like, if you needed anything to feel excited about what you're about to do when you go back to Egypt, like, you had it. You know, that's like, that's a good prayer meeting, a miracle. That's, you, you know, your friend, your coworkers was, had a cast when they came on, to, you know, or maybe not a cast, but they had crutches, and you laid hands on them at work, and they're like, ah, you know, they, they're jumping around. You're like, man, everything is good. I am ready to step into those things. So he's, ex he's excited. He's going home, and all of a sudden, um, this weird little two Three verses, Exodus 4, 24, there's really weird three verses, which is so, like, complexing and just doesn't make sense. And it says, and it came to pass by the, the way in the inn, and the Lord met him and sought to kill him. And, um, okay, this version says it came to pass at the encampment, so where they were staying at the night. The Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it as at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. Verse 26, so he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. So to give you a story, again, he's going back feeling good. He can't wait to throw his rod down and turn into a snake. Like He's excited about everything that he's just experienced. I'm sure there's some fear there, but if he was ever sure he heard from God, he is sure. And then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes to kill him. What's going on with that? So what we have right here is a reset. We have somebody who's been conformed by something but still had a purpose on his life, and God spoke to him, and he was coming back. But we had a reset, and the issue was his son 
like he he knew who he was and he knew the covenant and the promise and yet he never shared it so his son had not yet been circumcised so his house wasn't clean his house wasn't acceptable his household as we talked about it wasn't acceptable and even though he had got confirmation and got encouragement and got a clear word god was saying this reset cannot happen until some things in your house are in order and it we can clap to that, like, until some things, and I'll be honest, I didn't like reading that because there's some things in my life that I feel like God is just gently encouraging me to let go of. <laughs> and sometimes it's a gentle, sometimes it's a, hey, Kevin, you'd be better with that. And it's sometimes it's like, I'm not yelling. It doesn't show that God was continually reminding him, reminding him, reminding him, but I know it was a conversation because how else would his wife, who was not an Israelite, know what to do? And the fact, the context of that, the fact that he didn't do it, it probably means that actually God struck him, like he said God to kill him. He was, God struck him with the disease, so he was laying down and literally couldn't do anything. So either he told his wife, either he had mentioned to her before when his son was born, or he said, honey, I know what it is. I can do this. Whatever it was, she was like, you better be thankful for, for me because I just saved our family. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is in this reset, in this process of being transformed by the renewing of our mind, there are some things in our life that will stop our minds, stop our lives, our minds from being completely renewed or our lives from being transformed. Or if I will say, as Pastor was saying, it will block the reset. And, and this is crazy because we may think, like, in this case, it's something so what we may think minuscule. And it may even confusing. Why would God do all these things knowing that his son still wasn't circumcised? Why would God even lead him on the path back, do all these miracles, let him feel his presence, speak to him, show him all these things in the spirit? And um, it's, it's because God was still leading him to fulfill his purpose, but there came a point where the grace of God could no longer because then it would break God's own covenant. That makes sense? So because he had established that before, he said, I will kill you or allow you to die by allowing you to catch the sickness. I don't know if God gave him the sickness or I don't know if the sickness was in the air and it just got directed to him. I don't know what it is. But the truth is, it, it, he, his life was on the line because he came to a point where his promise, he, he was about to step into his promise, but the things that he still hadn't taken care of in his house, he could not bring them into. He was ready, and, and really what he was stepping into was a reset. His whole story from then on changed. He was still human. He still had anger issues, but he was doing it in the will of God. That makes sense. So what, what I feel to, what I'm trying to say tonight, and well, I guess I'll say this. There's, there's two things from this story that we can take away. Um, and again, I mentioned you can have blessings. You can be a good person. You can hear from God. You can see a mighty miracle. You can perform one. But there are specific things that we cannot bring with us into this reset. There are specific things that God has been whispering to us, um, specific people, specific hobbies, specific habits, specific mindsets, specific hang-ups that God is saying, this cannot go in this mindset because who you are to be in this next season, these things cannot live there. And the reason, amen, the reason, and he went out to the wilderness, if you would say, and he was trying to come back out of that. And some of us have been in wilderness where we're just kind of going in our own circles, and God is like, okay, this week, this moment, this season, I'm bringing the Pentecostals of Stone Mountain out of that. But us as individuals, there are things that cannot go there. And as I feel that, I felt so, not only for me, but for people in here, there are things that we either we think we need or we think they're not that big of a deal. That God is like, if you cut them off, Yes, your flesh is going to miss them at first because that's just natural because it's, it's a habit because we've been conformed. But if you let go of it, the promises, the blessings, and I don't mean just 
financial. I mean the joy and the operation of the spirit and the closeness of me that you have can't even compare to whatever temporal joy that that thing brings. And I feel that so strong. And the second thing is, is um, it feels weird saying this because I'm not a parent, but I'm just clear in though is there may be something in, in a household that needs to be cut off or disallowed. Whether it's a parent or a married couple, I don't know, but in this case, it was a parent. And we, you may know better as a parent, but you let your kid live that way. And maybe enjoy it or maybe passively be a part of this activity that, or thing or whatever it is, or something you've allowed for your kids that you didn't do yourself and you probably you know, know it's best, but it's not that big of a deal. Because remember, until this time, um, Moses had no inclination that they're, like, basically, when his kid was born, he knew he should have circumcised him, but he didn't. And that's the end of the story. Life is great. Life is so great, God even meets him on a road in fire. But so life is great until it was time for that new season, for that new, for that reset. And then it was brought up. So I, so the second story here is that for parents, it could be that Whatever God is trying to do in your life, it's not just you. It's the life of your household. Amen? And that there may be, you know, um, I just, the way my imagination works, like, in the modern day where kids decide their future and it's just a shame what the government is giving power to kids at age of 12 and 13 and 15 and removing and sometimes um, in the church, and I'm not, I don't have anything specific except I grew up and I had friends and some of the decisions that my friends were able to make at 15 years old was crazy. And, I, and the way I look at it, it was as if, um, could you imagine if Zipporah would have threw the knife to the son and said, circumcise yourself? He wouldn't have been able to do that. One, he probably didn't even know what that is. And if they would have explained it, he definitely wouldn't have done it. But there, you understand what I'm saying? So I, and I felt it strong, because I honestly I feel weird talking about parenting, but I do feel whether it's in this house or online or somebody who's watching later, like, and if, or future parents set to remember that your household, wherever God is taking you, he's taking your household. And if there are things in there that your kids are being exposed to, or let me rephrase it, things you're allowing that for God, when it's time for reset, when it's God to bring you to the next place to walk into a level of purpose, you're not going to be able to go forward until you deal with that. Amen? So, and the lesson again for all of us is God has a promise. God has a future, an expected end, and we, may all, we can all stand. And we are in such a special place. And I can feel it. I, I can feel it. I know everybody can feel it. And uh, God has just been showing himself so strong in these services. But I want to reinforce and remind us, and as we start this, this fast from, from today until Sunday in the all-night prayer meeting, I, I guess this is where it's at. I, Because I always say, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to end? And I literally had like two more. I told Jade I made my notes shorter so I could finish this time, and I didn't even get halfway through. But um. Uh, I feel like God wants us to truly, like part of the reset is literally the renewing of our mind. And what happens is when we conform to this world, we, we change. Instead of seeing ourselves as the way God sees us, we start to see ourselves as the way the world sees us or the way we see ourselves in the world. So then we don't pray certain prayers and we have low expectations. But I feel God allowed me to speak tonight, and I need this as much as anybody else. That he's saying, Kevin, there's a point in your life, maybe there's been times in your life where you saw this clear vision of who you were and what God wanted you to be, and maybe you were all on top of that. Or maybe life is, for some of us, life has just been so crazy, and we never thought much of ourselves because no one else did, but this whole time God was trying to call us and show us what he created us to be. And um, in the same way that it was one night, and it's a couple of days. I really feel that 
um, these three days as a church body, as our coverings, pastor and first lady are praying over us and have led, I feel led to lead us in this direction that um, what they're prophesying for themselves and speaking over the church, it's not just for the church as a whole, but it's for the each and every single individual person in this church body. And I wholly believe that not only it happens, but not only does God want it, but it will happen that some of us, as we go home, we think about it and we pray and just say, God, um, what... God, show me what areas in my life are conforming. God, show me what things are blocking me from a true reset. Because, God, I'm honestly, God, I'm tired of having these thoughts. God, I'm tired of being carnal. God, I'm tired of complaining. God, I'm tired of battling with lust. God, I'm tired of chasing money. God, I'm tired of jealousy. Whatever it is, God, I'm tired of arrogance. Whatever these things that we've resided as ourselves or God, I'm tired of being inconsistent. I do really good for a week or two and I fall off and then I just realize, see, why do I even try and the enemy comes and I just come to church and I've just accepted if I can just barely make it to heaven, that's okay. Those are all conforming thoughts that the world and Satan has given you so that way you can live bound. But there is freedom tonight. There's freedom this week. Sunday morning, you're not going to be the same. You're not going to be the same if 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 you have if unless you're like have a trip where you have to be a town, I tell you, be here on Saturday night. Be here on Saturday night. Put in extra days, extra mornings, a prayer, extra night to pray, whatever you have to do, because I can feel that there are, I see it in the spirit, there are chains, there are weights, there are burdens. If we can all raise our hand and pray right now, there are burdens that have been on some of us for years. Things on our mind that we've tried to go forward, we've tried to inch forward, and it's just so heavy, and we don't even know what to think anymore. And promises we thought that we things we thought God told us, and things we felt God promised, we we're wondering if it was just a figment of our mason of our imagination. And Satan has tried so hard to destroy us, but we are still here. And I declare right now in the name of Jesus that we as a church and each and every single individual who hears this sermon, whether in person, online, or later, whatever, that they will know that there is a hope, there is a place that God has prepared for them where they will live a truly sacrificed life. Not They are not going to have to be given into this world. They're not going to be bound by this world. But there will be freedom. There is freedom that God has for them. And this week, this prayer, this, this consecration, this five days that pastor put aside will be a landmark. It will be a landmark. It will be an experience that said, I was this. I was that. I was trapped by this. But freedom came. God came and he set me free. I'm um, set me free. I was transformed. I be, the light of God came through my life. I was no longer insecure. I was no longer afraid of my past, but I had the security and I had the confidence to be everything that God has called me to be. Oh, Jesus, right now, I pray that you would just move in this place right now, God. Let your spirit come across each and every heart, each and every mind, God. There are broken hearts in here, God. There are people who are frustrated, God, because they've been faithful. They've been trying, Lord Jesus, and this world, God, has just gotten on them and beaten them up, and the enemy whispers things, Jesus, but you have orchestrated this time, God, this season for this church that in one accord, that together as a body, we are going to move into the freedom. We are going to be have our lives transform and our minds transform so that we can hear your voice. We can do your will, God. We will no longer God, wonder in curiosity. We'll no longer wonder if we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, the right decision, the right job, the right school, all these things, God, these questions that we feel so helpless, God. We will have a security that we will hear your voice, God. We will hear your voice above the voice of the world, God, because you will restore, God. You will restore us, Jesus. So I pray, God, that you would go with us tonight night, each and every day, God, each and every voice of the enemy, each and every voice of the world, they may try to distract us, God. I pray you would put your protection around us, God, because you have appointed this time for the Pentecostals of Stone Mountain for us to step into something, Jesus, that we will never be the same. We will never be the same. We will never be the same, God. The visions of who we wish we could be one day, God, we will live that because you have appointed us and you have called us and you have given each and every single one of us a purpose, God, to move in your kingdom, God, a place of relationship where we feel so close to you and confident in who you are. We claim it tonight, Jesus. We claim it tonight, God. We will never be the same. We will never be the same. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise and claim it, God. We will never be the same. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what you're doing tonight, God, and what you're going to continue to do. 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus. One thing I want to add, um, it'll probably be tomorrow sometime. We're going to send out a link with prayer requests, and, and we'll set it up so it's anonymous or somehow we'll, we'll kind of do it. But um, And you can put your name if you want to. We'll, we'll figure that out. But um, part of our prayer on Saturday night, we're going to be putting the prayer requests up. And um, we are not settling for a tie. We, we're not settling for Satan, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. We are claiming victory. We are going to be going forward. Amen? That, that statement, I love it, says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Gates are protection. So that means the church is going to be on the, on the offense. Amen? So whatever thing that you hate Satan for, and I don't know about you, I got a list of stuff. Like, um, I'm taking all of them back, and I'm throwing them in his face and stomping on them and moving on in victory. Amen? Okay, so let's have victory. And again, look out for those things. And if you can be here, even if you work a shift and you don't get off to 2 a.m. in the morning, come at 2 a.m. in the morning. Let's all be here together on Saturday.